Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Total War Warhammer 2 Legendary Lord Lore video for Queek Headtaker, the warlord of the City of Pillars. Now, Queek was born into the breeding pits of Clan Moors, Clan Moors being a clan that had recently been on the rise within the Skaven Under Empire, gaining increasing amounts of influence, strength of arms, and just political power in general. This kind of turnaround and rise to the top of Skavendom had been done under the leadership of Lord Nordwell. Now, Lord Nordwell has always been a very intelligent rat, seeking, plotting, as well as a consummate warrior in his own right, but he's always on the lookout for more talent. And one day, word reached Lord Nordwell's ears of a rattling who, after a couple of days of being born, had eaten all of their siblings. Now, this was before this baby rattling had opened its eyes or even sprouted fur. Now, one or two being eaten is, you know, not unheard of within Skaven society, but an entire litter being devoured by a single sibling is, you know, pretty impressive for the Skaven. And so he thought, I need to harness this pure prodigious talent for violence and fratricide and really uplift him and harness that talent for the sake of Clan Moors. And so he went down and essentially picked out this rattling, who was by all accounts born much larger than all its other siblings, and proceeded to take it up and, for lack of a better word, really, started to hand-rear it. Now, you might ask whether any Skaven females involved in this, but the place this rattling had been born was, in fact, in the Skaven breeding pits. Now, this is where the Skaven females are kept, and effectively, they're just drugged and out of it on a mixture of chemicals and warp stone that have a hugely narcotic-like effect on Skaven females. And so, Skaven who are deemed, you know valid enough, warlords, etc., are allowed to breed with these females, but the sole purpose of females within Skaven society is that they're drugged up, they're kept out of it, and they are just forced to consistently just make babies and babies and babies and never not be pregnant, really. That's kind of their whole role in Skaven society. So this was the environment Queek, like all Skaven, was born into. So, Queek being brought up by Lord Nordwell himself was given the best of all equipment. He was given the best armor, the best weaponry, the best teachers, and Lord Nordwell wanted him not only to become a supremely fearful rat to face up against in combat, but also a good general and a savvy leader of Skaven as well. So this is the upbringing that Queek got. Now Skaven, for the most part, leave relatively short lives. They don't live very long, but they grow fast. And so only within a year or two, Queek had become a fully grown Skaven. Now he'd learned many of the lessons of his youth. He'd become a truly talented fighter. His speed was really barely matched by any he'd ever met in combat, and he was strong and big for a Skaven. Now, these lessons were taken to like a fish to water. However, the lessons of leadership and intelligence and wit and, you know, the subtler aspects of Skaven society, the, let's say, backhandedness of Skaven society was completely lost on Queek. He hated these aspects. He didn't like lying. It made him a very unusual Skaven, a very straightforward Skaven. Now, this straightforwardness has been kind of looked down upon as the years gone by, but his sheer skill as a fighter has served him well, and it wasn't too long before Lord Nordwell, once Queek had hit adulthood, started to place him in charge of military expeditions, considering the upbringing that Queek had had. So Queek begins to lead a number of successful expeditions against uh, Greenskins for the most part early on. Now, in one of these very early expeditions, he ends up raiding around the area of Black Crag. Many of you will recognize from Total War Warhammer 1. So he's going around this area and he eventually comes across the leader of Black Crag at the time, which is a chap called Morglum Blacktooth. Now, he ends up facing down against Morglum's orcs, they fight down, they face each other, and in one-on-one -on -one combat, Queek comes alive. He loves it. And he ends up decapitating Blacktooth. Now, not happy there, he decides to, you know, hang on to Blacktooth's head, and it said almost from the moment that Queek decapitated Blacktooth that he'd begun to hear 
kind of whispery. He seemed to be talking to the head. Now, no one wanted to jump to any conclusions. This is, after all, a leader of a Skaven war band. And so if you question him, you better come prepared. Otherwise, you too will have your head chopped off. So he's kind of like, people are like, okay, we'll ignore this for now. That's fine. He's just having a little whisper to that head. That's all right. He's just probably gloating in his victory. Good for Queek. But Queek doesn't stop there. He starts to carry around Blacktooth's head and, you know, starts to be seen conversing with it and chatting to it. And this seems to lead their expeditionary force to their next target, which is a bunch of gobbos hiding underneath the kind of labyrinthine tunnels of Black Crag. Now, none of the Skaven had any idea these tunnels were here, and so people are a little bit bemused by how Queek managed to find this place. Now, being the warlord, Queek was entitled to the first batch of spoils, and in the spoils he picked out, he seemed to go to a particular area and pick out a weapon that none of the Skaven had really found, and all the time kind of muttering, presumably to himself, but one would not be a sort of... Uh, too presumptuous, if one would also assume he was talking to Blacktooth, he discovered his weapon, Dwarf Gouger. Now, this would go on to be Queek's legendary piece of equipment that would just slice through any enemy armor. It was a mace with a hooked bladed end at one, with hooked up bladed side on one side, and just completely devastating weapon, and with the armor that the dwarves had, it just cut through it like butter. Now, no one really is ever sure whether Queek was, you know, a bit touched in the head to begin with from the very beginning of things, or whether it perhaps had something to do with amongst the kind of best of equipment he'd had. He'd also had warp shard armor, which is kind of warp stone infused into his metal armor. Now, this has had an effect on many living things, detrimental to those living things. One presumes, however, Skaven are a little bit more immune than most to the effects of Warpstone, but that could be one of the theories behind why perhaps Queek you know, started to whisper to Blacktooth's head oh so long ago. As kind of the months rolled on, Queek built himself kind of a trophy rack on his back, and, you know, Blacktooth took the first pride spot on what would become known as just Queek's trophy rack that he carts around with him wherever he goes. Blacktooth was promptly followed by other notable characters around the old world. Next to join Blacktooth was Ikit Scratch, who'd become a warlord by leading a treasonous band of Skaven, and they'd held up at this place called uh, Festa Spike, I believe. Now, Queek kind of like trying to think his way around, began to order his Skaven to dig holes all around the place that they'd held up. Now, this was a pretty common Skaven tactic, and Ikit Scratch recognized that what Queek was trying to do was, you know, just have all of his Skaven burst through all the holes at once and surround them. He took precautions. He started to lay traps near the holes. He posted men at each one of the individual holes. But Queek, not being completely unaware of tactics and strategy, is just the underhandedness and, you know, using your intellect to get out of a good bloody brawl is the stuff that Queek doesn't like. And so he took this kind of approach to his strategy a very unscaven-like strategy, and charged all of his skaven through one of the tunnels, one of the dozens, if not hundreds of tunnels he'd ordered them to build, and because the Ikit Scratch had spread his forces so thin, they just plowed through and took them all by surprise, were immediately behind their back lines, and just wiped all the traitors out. And so Ikit Scratch took pride of place upon Queek's trophy rack, and it's Ikit Scratch who we see at the front of Queek's trophy rack, whose spine and ribs are still attached, and who goes all over the other side. Now, quite the full details of why Ikit Scratch deserved more than just a head, and had his whole spine and rib cage removed, we're never really told as far as I'm aware. But he does have pride of place on the front of Queek's trophy rack. So we have Blacktooth, we have Scratch, and these were soon joined by Baron Ulbrich Kraus of Avaland. Now, exactly what Baron Ulbrich Kraus did, I'm not 100% sure myself, but it's his human hands that you can see tied to Queek's trophy rack. Now, Queek is very famous for if you touch one of his trophies, he takes your hands. So it may be that this poor Avalander Baron 
had at one point met Queek in combat or was trying to do a nefarious deal with Queek or something bad had happened whereby he touched Queek's rack, had his hands removed ever to be strapped to Queek's trophy rack themselves. This was added to by King Krug, Iron Hand of Karak Draz. Now, Karak Draz is what Greenskins known as Black Crag. So this is one presumes the deposed king of what is now called Black Crag, and he was killed by Queek, and his head adorns Queek's uh, trophy rack as well. Now, with all of these victories, with defeating all of these notable characters in battle, Queek developed a first for it, and indeed developed a reputation for this ruthless nature of his. And his deeds began to spread throughout the Skaven, Ender, uh, Skaven Under Empire, and indeed, he has become one, if not the most, notorious warlord outside of the Council of Thirteen themselves, of course, that is rampaging around the Skaven Under Empire at the moment. Now, given some of these early traits, him gallivanting a row around, collecting trophies for his trophy rack, uh, Nordwell said, okay, Queek, you're doing pretty well, and decided to put him in charge of the Skaven army at the City of Pillars. To you and me, we may recognize better as Karak Eight Peaks. Now, Karak Eight Peaks had long been ruled over by a really green skins had taken it over, had run it for a very long time. Skaven have intruded, and obviously King Belagar Ironhammer is trying to reclaim what is his by kind of birth, if you will. And so we now have several factions in the City of Pillars, all fighting for dominance at the moment. So Queek, Skarsnik, and Belagar are kind of locked in this eternal struggle for Karak Eight Peaks, for dominance over Karak Eight Peaks. But even though the Skaven only have kind of a few levels of Karak Eight Peaks, it's still become one of the most sort of important Skaven colonies uh, around the old world. So very much Queek's been put in charge of a very important site for Skavendom. And so this is where Queek ends up spending most of his time, really battling it out with Skarsnik and Belagar. He has, however, gone on a couple of very notable kind of expeditions, the first of which actually brought him into contact with one of the most famous in our world, if perhaps not the Warhammer world itself, Skaven around, and that is Fanquol. Now, Fanquil is a mischievous, no, beyond mischievous, nefarious, shall we say, Gracia, which is a Skaven magic user uh, within the Skaven Under Empire. Now, Fanquil had got involved in a whole bunch of trouble, but suffice it to say, Fanquil had been kind of taken up and reinserted back into the Gracia order, and eventually the leader of the Graciers, uh, Kritzlik, uh, had managed to catch up with Fanquil and told him, look, Fanquil, You've been up to all sorts of weirdness, most recently probably up in Lustria. You're back. You kind of keep buggering up, but here's another mission for you. Uh, go out and get this artifact for us from Karak Angul. And he said, okay, what's this artifact? And it's meant to be something called the Hand of Vectik, uh, which is the hand of a very powerful Skaven magic user that they could use to, uh, you know, just channel power through and would additionally add to Fanquil's already innate power, making him even more powerful, or making whoever had the artifact more powerful. So Fanquil was initially accompanied by a warlord from Clan Moors known as Bonestash. And uh, Bonestash was leading the expedition with Fanquil. They'd only just gotten uh, sort of underway when they were set upon by Ikit Claw from Clan Scryer, who kind of laid down the party, usurped leadership of this expedition, and he was going to go to Karak Angul for, you know, slightly mysterious reasons. He wasn't telling anyone why Ikit Claw wanted to go to Karak Angul. They all go, and Fanquil, you know, he's a bit of a bootlick, shall we say, and manages to kind of get into Ikit Claw's not quite good graces, but to stop Ikit Claw killing him at the very least. And they march on to Karak and Gul. Now, Ikit Claw is kind of a separate issue, but Ikit Claw is effectively trying to divine some kind of massive bomb to blow up the whole of the Karak and all the dwarves inside. Now, that story is slightly aside from Queek's involvement. 
Queek eventually gets word that Bonestash had been murdered and sets off with his own troops to go and avenge the betrayers of Bonestash and, by association, the betrayers of Clan Moors itself. He eventually comes across Fankwell, who'd escaped from Ikit Claw and his whole debauch scheme of building this bomb, but, you know, he still was part of this treasonous party. And Queek is like, okay, traitor, time for you to go, time to kill you. Now, at the time, Queek had a space on his trophy rack and kind of, like, pointed at it and very heavily insinuated that Fankwell was about to be added to the rack himself. Fankwell does his, let's say, again, not quite charming, but boot-licky thing and manages to stay in the good graces of Queek and says to Queek, look, Queek, I'm a very powerful magic user. Use me, and together with your army, we can march into Karak Ankul and completely destroy it. Now, by this time in the story with his adventures with Ikit Claw, Fankwell had actually managed to find this hand of a uh, Vectic or Vectek even, and he'd had this hand, and so he knew that he could bolster his own power and really summon something powerful. Now, what Fankwell was hinting at here to Queek was that he could summon a vermin lord. Now, guys, I've covered vermin lords in my Skaven army video, which if you haven't seen, do check the top right-hand corner or down in the description below for a link. But vermin lords are effectively demons of the horned rat, who is the god of the Skaven. He's not dissimilar to a chaos god, but not a chaos god in his own right. He has his own demons, and these are vermin lords. And the idea being behind vermin lords is that some warlords who are uplifted to the side of the horned rat himself, um, if they've done enough in life to earn it, can become vermin lords themselves. So the warlords get promoted in the afterlife, can become vermin lords, who can then be resummoned to the mortal realm. Now, Vectek, who's hand that Queek had was one of these surely illustrious warriors that would have made it all the way to verminhood, vermin lordhood in the aftermath of their life. So he's pretty confident that he could summon this vermin lord. So Queek and Fanquil launch a fresh offensive against Karak and Kool. And they're fighting their way up through the keeps and through the levels and through the deeps. And they're actually making great progress. Fanquil himself is a little bit off put by the way Queek addresses warfare. Whereas most other Skaven would be kind of taking cat prisoners, capturing dwarves. In one kind of disgusting note, it's mentioned that Fanquil, this kind of goes through his mind as he's kind of thinking of all the money he could be making with all the stuff that Queek and his troops are destroying. He thinks to himself, oh, there's lots of barrels here, so much equipment, we could resell that. And then his mind wanders on to the idea of food, and he kind of remembers how delicious dwarf babies are, and if only if he could capture a brooding pair of dwarves, he'd nail the market in dwarves babies in Skaven Blight and become a supremely rich Skaven indeed. So these are the kind of things that are going through Fankwell's head as uh, they are charging up through the depths of Karak and Kool. Queek, on the other hand, has very different ideas. He doesn't want to make money, he just wants to destroy all the disgusting dwarf things. He's developed such an unadulterated hatred for the dwarves, he just tells everything to be put to the sword, to be put to the torch, and that's what he wants to happen. So they continue up, and eventually the dwarves manage to mount some sort of resistance. Um, a lot of their army, you see, had been sent away, and they, the sort of most remnants of this army, had gone down into the depths of Karakangul to stop Ikit Claw's plan with the bomb. However, Fankul managed to escape from that conflict, but the dwarves who'd gone down there to fight it were still down there, and they couldn't get back in time to stop Queek charging up and taking the Karak itself. So. This is their dilemma. Now, what they have managed to do, however, is capture a Skaven drilling machine. And indeed, one of the guys there, a dwarf engineer who'd kind of been leading the charge in this story from the dwarven perspective, known as Clarak Bronzehammer, um, had this idea of, like, let's use the Skaven drilling machine. That will cut through the mountain and we can get there in doubly quick time. So what happens is Queek is charging up to meet this dwarven resistance and there's 
pretty confident it won't hold out for too long and then they'll pretty much be free and clear this is the last gasp of the remaining dwarves within the Karak to just hold out a little bit longer they're desperately hoping the dwarven army will return although by any normal measurement of distance and travel in the tunnels that the dwarves have access to this is a sheer impossibility and as Queek launches himself into combat in his very regular kind of enthusiastic style lopping off dwarven heads slicing through dwarven plates and just slashing his way away along with his trained Skaven guard who would later be officially titled the Red Guard but Queek always has his elite storm vermin around him at all times so at this point they just haven't been named in Warhammer canon they are during the end times and you guys know how much I dislike the end times so Queek with his storm vermin charge up start absolutely laying into these dwarves and they it's just a matter of time they're fighting as all dwarves will do they will not give up they're reduced to fighting back to back in pockets of resistance when suddenly there's this kind of rumbling and it starts really low and it starts to build and build and build and build and suddenly the wall behind all the skaven bursts open and they see a skaven drilling machine so like oh brilliant lads and just continue charging forward however what pops out are the remnants of the Dwarven army and now they have the Skaven trapped on both sides from the front and from the rear and the Dwarves start to take advantage of this. It looks like Queek is about to be surrounded and massacred. Queek himself of course isn't running at this stage, he's still fighting on for he wants to take some more Dwarfing's heads. But all the rest like, oh my god, it's a slaughter. The Skaven are sort of confused and, you know, a confused Skaven is not a good Skaven. They're more likely to run than they are to do anything else. At this point, Queek withdraws from the front line. He looks for Fancall. He eventually finds Fancall, who at that point had been kind of, you know, sneaking off. Because Queek likes to lead from the front, unlike any kind of civilized Skaven, in Fancall's opinion, he was like, oh, he was like, look, Gracia, I don't trust Gracia, so you're going to stand right next to me as this battle rages around us. Now, Fancall, as soon as Queek had sort of launched himself and lost himself in the bloodlust of battle, Fancall had kind of been slowly backing up and backing up and backing up. And now we're somewhere in the middle of the ranks, far from Queek. So Queek had to go look for him. He eventually finds Fanquil, is really pissed, threatens to kill him again. He's like, you promised me magic. You promised me a summon, essentially a summoned vermin. Or he doesn't quite say it. He's just like, you promised me powerful magic to win this battle. Now is the time. So Fanquil taps into, he's like, okay, just to preserve my own head, I'd have liked to save this artifact, but we're going to use it. He taps into the power of the hand he'd had, the artifact, and he starts to reach into the warp, into the realm of chaos or the realm of the horned rat instead, shall we say. They are disturbingly similar, one could argue. And he starts to reach in and summon forth Vectek himself, who he was sure had become a vermin lord. And he taps into the power and strange things start flashing in his mind's eye. He starts to see the claw as it was before he found it. He starts to see another Skaven who'd found it. And he starts to see that this Skaven was abandoned and lost. And it, it doesn't really matter who this Skaven is. It doesn't really get into it. It doesn't matter as far as Queek's concerned. But this Skaven swore a vengeance against all other Skavendom for leaving him abandoned in the tomb. Now when Queek found the artifact, he actually failed to notice the skeleton of this Skaven in the tomb. Didn't even register with him. But this guy had been trapped all alone and swore vengeance against all Skavendom. And he ate the original hand of Vectek. And he would consumed it, consuming all of its power. He then lopped off his own hand and carved a hidden sign onto it. That would remain hidden from those who weren't necessarily looking for it. And this way he knew he would have his vengeance against any who dared use this artifact so tapping into this kind of realizes too late he doesn't really understand what's going on with these visions he sees and sure enough by the time the whole vision comes to clarity and he can see the carving being put into the new hand he sees it's the mark of corn and so what he's been doing is he's been tapping into the realm of corn and it's already too late he doesn't summon a vermin lord but he summons Scarsbrand, the greater demon of Corn, and not just any greater demon. This is Corn's right-hand guy, or at least he was. And Scarsbrand 
is just starting to emerge. He's enormous. He towers above all of the Skaven and all of the dwarves, and he's starting to take shape. He begins as just a shadow, and slowly and slowly he starts to take full material form. Fanquil can't stop it at this point. He knows there's nothing to be done. And so he begins to hide and scarpers away. It's like, oh my lord. And he can feel the greater demon's voice in his mind going, Magic user, I will crush the life out of you. Your days are numbered, effectively. Now, the problem here is that Korn hates all magic, as do all of his representatives. So to be summoned forth by a wizard, not even a chaos wizard, a rattling wizard, wizard was something that would be avenged and Scarsbrand would not have his vengeance robbed. So Scarsbrand, if he ever makes it into material form, first order of business, kill Fanquil and kill everything else around him for the murder, the death, the killing will sustain him. As they say, more skulls for the skull throne. So the, this greater demon is starting to emerge in the middle of this battle. And even the parts of him that material, like his hooves, are starting to emerge. But they can still trample on things. They're killing things around him. The Skaven and the Dwarves are still killing each other. So having this greater demon begin to emerge and just start massacring the Skaven and the Dwarves alike... Queek is not a fool. He doesn't sit there and go, oh, although it maybe does enter his head for a little moment, maybe I should challenge this demon of chaos. He goes, no, screw that. We are out of here. So he orders all the Skaven to retreat. Just run for your lives, basically. Now the dwarves, having sandwiched them in between them, just start to hack them down. Now it's at this point that the dwarves, or that some of the dwarves who are unaffected by this kind of madness setting over them. Now there's only a couple of pockets of resistance here. Around I believe it was a rune lord who was in the battle at the time and he obviously had some kind of magic protections that were keeping the men around him sane. But the majority of the dwarves in the Karak started killing Skaven, started killing each other. It was just a bloodbath. But those who retain their sanity begin to notice that by cutting down the Skaven you're just adding more blood which is making the demon appear even quicker. So there's a shout that goes out amongst the dwarves to allow the Skaven to pass and so Queek gets the hell out of Dodge having been betrayed by Fanquil and you know not getting the victory he so much wanted. Slowly but surely Scarbrand started to come into being so much so that he was able to start swinging his axe down upon the hordes below his feet plowing down swathes of Skaven and Dwarves with each swing it's just turning into an absolute massacre now with the Skaven effectively out of the scene the Dwarves and their madness going over them it leaves them fighting each other or fighting the remnants of whatever Skaven were left without a thought of what was going on as far as his demon was concerned it's at this point with all of the dwarves still firing, still trying to take down this demon, just like pummeling him down, but nothing has effect. That is until this very clever young engineer who we mentioned earlier, Karlak Bronzehammer, notices that everything they fire at him, all the thunderers, all the cannons, just aren't touching this demon. However, one cannon strike hits, but that's the only one, and they're trying to figure out why this one actually affected it. And what this engineer realized was that Scarbrand, the part of him that had been hit and hurt, was standing very close to a statue of Valeha, one of the ancestor gods of the dwarves. And so uh, he has a theory that whatever magical runes had been placed on this statue, whatever magic probably long lost to dwarven kind had been set in the stone of this sacred statue must have an effect on Scarbrand himself. So he runs over to the rune lord, battling his way through the entirety of the battlefield to find one of the artillery crew who was there and ask him for his blasting charges. And then while doing this, he starts to climb the statue. All the while, the greater demon is just hacking and slashing. The dwarf clambers up 
to the arm which is holding an axe in this statue's arm and blows up at the shoulder the arm which he times to perfection with the mathematical skill and engineering know-how only a master dwarf engineer could muster and the arm is blown up perfectly timed so that the axe falls square in the middle of Scarbrand's head banishing him back to the realms of chaos and really allowing all the dwarves to be slightly clear-minded once this action had taken place. So with the greater demon defeated by this dwarven engineer, the shouts amongst the dwarves for this hero who saved them go up and uproar he's praised as a hero. Now, unbeknownst to this engineer, however, Fanquil was hiding behind the leg of the very statue he'd just climbed. And Fanquil being the shallow, I don't know, insecure for lack of a better word, asshole that he is, decides this dwarf shouldn't get any bloody praise, leaps out from behind the statue, fires off a bolt of warp lightning at Clarak, the engineer, hits him, knocks him off the statue, and he falls to his death, at which point Thanquil casts Skitter Leap, which is a teleportation spell that the Skaven know and disappears. But Queek had learnt his lesson yet again, and never to trust those goddamn Graciers, although his distrust of Graciers existed long before Thanquil ever came onto the scene. Another expedition that Queek went on a little bit more recently, when he was around four years old, so all of this has happened before Queek has hit four years old, bear in mind. So Queek gets a mission from Lord Nordwell, chief of Clan Moors, and the Council of Thirteen kind of put together this idea. They wanted Queek to lead an army against Karakazul. Now, Karakazul had long been famed for its weapon-making skills, and of late, they'd reached such a level of stability that they were able to produce more and excessive amounts of weapons, which they were either trading or loaning out to other dwarven Karaks. Now, the Council of Thirteen were worried that this sort of inundation of high quality really fantastic weaponry would turn the tides of war across Skavendom and even in particular Karak Eight Peaks, Queek's home. So they design an idea led by Clan Moors to go and destabilize or destroy Karak Azul to stop the flow of these weapons into the rest of the Dwarven Kingdoms. So in order to do this, Lord Nordwell sends two associates. He sends one of his top advisors, a rat by the name of Sleek Sharpwit, and the Council of Thirteen sends a Gracia named Razzle along with them. So Sleek and Razzle are sent to go get Queek and to take him and the army to Karakazul to get rid of these weapons. However, upon their arrival in Karakazul, Razzle and Sleek are not greeted in the warmest of terms by Queek. He doesn't want to go, he refuses. Razzle had been accompanied by several albino guards, which are kind of like white or greyish storm vermin who are considered like the elite of the elite of storm vermin and they're often put in charge of protecting representatives of the council of 13 if not the council of 13 the ruling council of the skaven empire itself so these are not uh, kind of rubbish namby pamby warriors these are elite guards so they go to Queek. Queek says, no, I don't want to do it. And then Sleek, being the very smart Skaven he is, has heard stories about Queek, kind of understands what might motivate him. So he tells Queek that if he takes an army to Karakazul, he'll be able to face off against none other than King Kazador Thunderhorn himself. Now, Kazador was a renowned king warrior in Karakazul, and this grabbed Queek's attention. Although it was rumored that King Kazador had recently become maybe a shadow of his former self, after a number of years ago, a orc warband managed to break into Karakazul, slaughtering a huge number of dwarves and taking the king's family hostage. And the only thing they left behind of his family was his son, who they committed the worst thing you could ever do to a male dwarf, and that was shave him, and they nailed him down to his father's throne, and left him there for shame. 
So King Cazador had a huge grudge going on and that is the kind of legend that was going around at the time about Cazador but he was still a warrior with a fearsome reputation and so Queek wanting to add another head to his trophy case reluctantly agreed to lead the expedition solely and he expressed it very openly to get the head of King Cazador Thunderhorn. And so, the expedition set off. Now, as they went along, Sleek and Razzle started to discuss things. They'd begun to kind of amass a number of other Skaven from different areas that the Council of Thirteen had committed to the cause. All in all, it's estimated that Queek was going to lead, once everyone had gathered, an army of Skaven numbering in a 100,000. That is a vast horde of Skaven marching on Karak Azul. But on the way, while they're discussing meeting up with reinforcements and what Queek's like and how mad is he, can he be trusted to lead this expedition, Razzle starts to talk to the fellow advisor who was sent by Lord Nordwell, Sleek, about like betraying Queek, taking over the expedition themselves and leading it successfully because Queek was a bloody nutcase. They'd witness him, he'd threatened Razzle, a representative of the Council of Thirteen, he'd grabbed him by the throat. There was all kinds of things going on with Queek that they didn't trust. But obviously, they didn't feel they could match Queek in any kind of challenge or no Skaven would ever face off in that kind of honorable combat challenge-like way. So they, so Razzle at least, began plotting. Sleek, you know, keeping his cards close to his chest, kind of never really agreed to betray Queek, um, because Sleek was like, no, Queek's a, he's part of Clan Moors, I could never betray another member of Clan Moors, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And so Razzle takes things into his own hands, and he causes, essentially they come to a blockage in the tunnels, he clears the blockage, but he does it in such a way, such an explosion of magic, that it's very obviously temporary. And by the time Queek, who by this stage is accompanied by his, what is kind of painted as his right-hand guy, who is named Scar. Now, Scar is a huge Skaven, bigger even than Queek, just massive for a Skaven, but he also likes to collect uh, Dwarven armor. So he has a full set of Grumbrindel armor, and the axe that he had found that had been manufactured by Karak Azul. So he's carrying around this huge battle axe, and he goes around in dwarven armor, and he's just this enormous, massive skaven. And he leads what would later become known as the Red Guard, Queek's elite storm vermin that he's trained himself. So they're a bit intimidated by this, so they cause this cave-in, and Sleek and Razzle skitter off, um, ahead of the whole group, to go and meet up with representatives of Clan Rictus, in an attempt to usurp Queek's position as leader of the expedition. So Queek and his handyman Scar come up to this collapsed cave-in and they start to set about their scaven trying to dig through so they can get the rest of their troops through this gap. So they set busy to work and Queek, not wanting to wait, insists on going first, but the hole isn't quite ready. It's jagged, it's tight, like even for a rat to squeeze themselves through, it's a very uncomfortable fit. But Queek, irregardless, he has to remove his trophy rack, so he takes that off, sets it down, orders one of his guys to bring it, but not to touch any of the trophies, otherwise he would, of course, take their hands. Um, so bring the trophy rack through. So he's crawling through in just his armor, and his armor's catching on jagged bits of rock. It's scraping. Warp dust is kind of coming off it. But Queek manages to, like, finally find a bit of, I want to say, light at the end of the tunnel, but it's all on the ground. It's not light. Found an opening at the end. Sticks his snout out and immediately kind of gets a whiff of a skaven and instinctively almost darts his nose back in just as an axe slices across where the opening was. Now, Queek tries to back up down the burrow, but it's too tight. He can't get out. So he decides to lunge his snout out one more time as the attacker was coming to check the hole, bites the attacker by the leg, who is a skaven, and starts to just, like, thrash, thrash about and just really hurts this guy's leg, upon which the attacker collapses 
and Queek manages to scurry his way out of the hole. He's greeted by eight large storm vermin bearing the clan marks of Clan Rictus, and this is obviously some kind of scheming ambush. The first of the attackers lunges towards Queek. He spins with almost unbelievable speed, and with one strike of Dwarf Gouger, decapitates the upper jaw and head of the first Skaven, where a bubbling foam of gore erupts from what's left of the Skaven's neck. Next, he faces off against the others. They begin to surround him, stabbing wildly. At which point, Queek just takes a running jump at two of them, taking them both off of their feet. The first, he'd managed to gut with his sword. The second was out of commission, having landed with Queek's armoured elbow straight into its throat. Now, Queek only really had to deal with five more. So he turns to face the rest of the group, and the halberd strikes him on his shoulder guard, kicking up some warp dust. The warp dust sprays off, slightly burning whatever it lands on, and that's when Queek does his move. He uses his gift of immense speed to decapitate another one of the storm vermin, and with the next, he uses Dwarf Gouger to form a massive uppercut, smashing through the Skaven's lower jaw, so Dwarf Gouger protruded from the top of the Skaven's head. Now, that was just two more corpses on the ground. Behind him, however, the leader had snuck up and was stabbing at Queek with a dagger, getting straight for his throat. Queek had no time to move, no time to react. That is when Scar appeared and took the dagger straight into the chest. Scar was already bleeding and bruised, having forced his way through the small crack after Queek ordered him to follow him through the tunnel. Scar, being so large, had to remove all of his armor, and thus the chest blow proved fatal, and Scar collapsed in front of Queek. The killing of Scar enraged Queek to such a degree that his eyes lit up with a ferocity therefore too unseen, and his grip on his weapons tightened to such a degree that his own claws dug into his hands, causing them to bleed. Queek looked so absolutely infuriated that it just terrified the remaining Skaven. They laid down their arms and began to run. The next we hear of Queek is him arriving at the city of Deathclaw. Now, Deathclaw is the Skaven city underneath Karakazul, and this is the point at which they will launch their attack on Karakazul from. Queek, knowing that there had been some kind of treason afoot, is quick to try and track down all of those who caused it. He's dragging the battered and beaten and obviously tortured body of one of his attackers along with him. But it seems that this attacker hasn't revealed any of his plans as of yet. Queek makes his home in the most comfortable, like, alcove or lair within the city of Deathclaw, which happens to belong to the one in charge of Deathclaw before Queek's arrival, which was a warlock by the name of Fizzquick. Now, Fizzquick wasn't really aware that Queek was going to take over his room, and and Queek had proceeded to decorate it in his usual bloody fashion. There were body parts all over the place. The lair now stank of just death and corpses, and it was very unpleasant. Now, Sleek is there to greet Queek. Now, Sleek, being the, the sniveling example of Skavendom that one might imagine, manages to convince Queek that he didn't betray him. It was all Razzle. And so Razzle gets most of the blame, but there is one thing that can be kind of made up for it, and that's the fact that apparently Razzle, with the use of spies or some sort of conundrum, and the Queek hadn't even bothered to check on him, had managed to find and heal Scar in the time it took Queek to reach Deathclaw. So they have Scar, he's still alive, despite the fact Queek had actually found another Skaven, seemingly not quite able to process the death of Scar, and was just calling him Scar in the interim. But the original Scar was still alive, and around in the city of Deathclaw. Now Sleek is old for a Skaven. He's 12 years old, it said. He walks on crutches, he can barely see, he's an old man of Skavendom which is a rare thing in its own right. So he is obviously very sharp-witted and very reminiscent of the qualities that many Skaven admire, and obviously he was behind some of the treachery that Queek had 
faced, but he'd managed to talk his way out of it, some of it being this idea that he's an old man anyway and no threat to begin with. He does a couple of things that are very off in Deathclaw, obviously trying to betray Queek. He manages to sneak into Queek's room when Queek eventually leaves it, and he kills the captured uh, Clan Rictus assassin that they'd sent after Queek. Not really an assassin as such, but, you know, just the member of Clan Rictus who was looking to ambush him, and choked him out with his crutch, killing him so he couldn't talk even if he wanted to. Then he goes over to Warlock Fizzquick and he says he explains the situation to him hoping to gain another ally in his kind of crusade against making Queek give up leadership of this expedition. And then he goes to find his old pal Razzle who had been hiding out ever since he heard Queek was on his way to Deathclaw. So they're meeting Razzle and Sleek, the old rat. They're chatting about what had transpired, and Razzle has some good information. He's been spying on the dwarves above them, and he's got word that the dwarves are leaving. The whole army is leaving. This mission is going to be easier than they could ever imagine. And then they hear kind of a ruckus outside. Razzle sends out one of his albino guard, one of whom was already missing, but as far as Sleek understood, he was guarding Scar um, while he was healing. So, they hear this ruckus, and almost immediately, the albino guard comes flying back through the door, being obviously smashed through, and lo and behold, Queek has tracked them down. Now, at this point, they are kind of buggered. Sleek has kind of survived to this point by saying he wasn't a betrayer, and him and Razzle being caught together is a very bad situation. But Sleek, sharp-witted as ever, thus the name, tells Queek he was checking for Scar, Queek's buddy, and that they have great information that the dwarves are leaving and that this mission will be an easy victory. Queek is livid at this news. If the dwarves leave, he won't get his head, he won't get his battle, he won't get his victory. And he's very upset, and he demands they all get the troops ready immediately to march up on Carrick Azul. Now, Queek disappears off, but not before kind of walking into the room. He was always kind of hiding something behind his back. No one knew what it was. The boys tried to have a look. Razzle tried to poke his head around. But then, to make his point extra intimidating, Queek slams down the head of the albino guard, which is still dripping with blood, with viscera hanging from the neck, digging his claws into it, causing it to bleed even more. This was the guard that had been sent to guard Scar, and Queek had taken his head. The opportunity to spar with one of the elite albino guard was just simply too good to pass up. So Queek, not wanting to miss out on the battle, leaves the room, and these guys are like, what the hell is this guy's problem? This is a perfect Skaven sneak attack. The dwarves leave, we take the Karak, we kill everything in there, easy peasy. Who is this fecking lunatic? This is unacceptable. And so it just serves to enrage his co-conspirators more, but Queek's actually fine with it. In fact, he even tells them, conspire all you like. You are not strong enough to take down Queek. Up in the halls of Karakazul, King Kazador is gathering his troops to march out. When one of the mercenary troops, a human or an umgi as the Skaven called them, uh, spots something out the corner of his eye, he sees this glint of crimson armor near the stairwell to one of the deeps lower down in the Karak, and he's sure it was a Skaven. And he rushes over to see what was going on, and lo and behold, they find a note written in a manic scroll that effectively says, Here below you are Skaven, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. And then that's it. So their whole plan is put on hold. The dwarves aren't going anywhere. And so the battle for Karakazul begins, down in the ninth deep of the Karak, the dwarves line up with all their fortifications intact, forming the sturdy battle lines that dwarves are known for. Queek has his army, his vast horde, ready and willing to go. 
Now this is the point where Sleek Sharpwit, the old Skaven, goes up to Queek and he says, Queek, we have tunnels, we can go round, we can shut off their guns, give me a contingent, we can have this strategy. And Queek says, no, we will take them head on and leads an enormous charge of Skaven himself leaping into the fray of the front lines as his horde of a hundred thousand quickly follows behind him. For the most part, that is. Sleek, staying behind, trying to think of what's going on. Now, Queek's first foray into battle goes exceedingly well. He is hacking down dwarves left and right, leaping over their heads, hacking them from behind. And Queek and the rest of the Skaven are making inroads. They charge past the first front line of the dwarves, continuing on through into the second rank. But that is when it's unveiled. An organ gun at the top of the steps, firing down into the Skaven, smashing into the storm vermin in front of Queek, and sending Queek flying back as though he was himself, in fact, a projectile. Having seen this, all of the Skaven who are around assume Queek is dead, and reports get back to Sleek Sharpwit after a while of the battle going on, and he says, all right, I'm going to take charge here. He leads a contingent of Clan Eshin assassins and gutter runners and alike and they go and they look for the tunnels to get in behind the dwarven lines to shut off all those guns however queek does not die that easily and he gets the storm vermin in front of him who took most of the cannon shot to the chest gets him up and the first thing he does is the thing he's most terrified of is that he has lost one of his precious advisors one of his precious trophies the heads on his trophy rack and he scans them to see who's missing and indeed Blacktooth, the first of his trophies, his perhaps prized possession in the world, has been absolutely shattered and no longer rests on his trophy rack. Queek is enraged by this and launches into a fresh attack upon the dwarven hordes, leaping above the cannons and taking out the cannon crew that had so assailed his trophy rack that it was an unforgivable crime to Queek, and he lopped off their heads one after the other, causing absolute carnage behind the dwarven lines. Now, Queek was causing such a ruckus that everyone could finally spot him out from the horde of Skaven, and Handrick Hammerhand, who had been a dwarf posted at Karak Eight Peaks recognized Queek and was like, I am going to end the existence of this filthy Skaven once and for all, and we will write him out of the Book of Grudges. And he breaks his line, he breaks from his position, and that is a huge error. It allows the rest of the Skaven to power through. Now, how one man leaving his position allows this to happen is anyone's question. Perhaps Hendrik Hammerhand is truly a battle genius taking down hundreds of Skaven at a time, but his absence from the line causes the line to break and the Skaven begin to overrun the Dwarven position, at least the first line of the defense of the Dwarven position. And they go charging forward and Hammerhand never quite gets to Queek, I don't believe, for a number of things in the battle end up holding him up, including, I believe, a massive rat ogre. But irregardless, Queek is charging forward. He spots Kazador, his prize, the whole reason for him being here and he begins to try and push the Skaven through because Kazador is not only arriving smashing through the lines causing untold carnage in the Skaven lines but he's causing almost a terrifying effect to sweep through the Skaven army. Now unusually in the battle on a slight side note the guns had been silent which allowed the Skaven to come through however Kazador and his second line of defense were sweeping up massacring all the Skaven that lay in front of of them and having such a turning tide of effect of battle it began to visibly affect the morale of the Skaven around him. Queek knew he had only moments to salvage this battle and summoned up one of the weapons teams of the warp fire thrower and ordered them to fire on the dwarven second line to break them to encourage the Skaven to get them to continue to push forward but as soon as the lever was pulled back on the warp fire thrower it exploded 
exploded, sending the second man of the team holding the barrel of warp fire to zoom up straight into the roof of the ninth depth, which was significantly high above the whole of battle. Not being persuaded, Queek turns to his right and sees a rattling gunner, and again orders them to open fire on the secondary line of dwarves approaching. The rattling gunner fires, click, 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 but nothing happens. Almost visibly relieved, the rattling gunner kind of rubs his brow, thinking that his weapons team too was about to explode, but suffice it to say, the damage was done. The carnage that Cazador and the second line of the fence caused to the Skaven, even though they'd managed to shut down some of the guns, was just devastating to Skaven morale, and as Skaven are one to do, they all began to run, scattering this full frontal assault on a heavily fortified dwarven stair position was just too much for the horde to handle and they broke once Queek got back to Deathclaw, the Skaven town, he was incensed. Everyone could see it. All the Skaven scurried out of the way. They knew that Queek was looking for something, someone, anything to take out his frustrations on. When suddenly he turned on his horde of injured, of hurt, of remaining Skaven, turned to them, weapons in hand, they knew he was about to start just slaughtering indiscriminately, and they all started to run. So many, in fact, it caused a stampede. Those who were injured bled out. They fell under the foot of the other Skaven. By the end of it, they all ran into almost a dead road, a dead tunnel, with Queek following through. This is hundreds of Skaven running away from this one Skaven, and then desperately clawing at the walls of the dead end of this tunnel they knew their death had come but hundreds had died just under the stampede itself and just as he was about to launch into the slaughter Queek got hold of his senses and saw the carnage he caused just running through and decided not to punish any of them at this stage and walked away but that is the kind of fear that Queek can instill over his Skaven horde. The old sleek Sharpwit had also managed to survive this ongoing battle and barely escaped with his life after him and the clan Eshen, led by an assassin known as Fang Dao, had managed to silence a large majority of the guns, but it still was too late to make a difference in the frontal assault. But they'd just about managed to escape with their lives, and now they needed another plan. How were they going to shut down the weapons of Karak Azul? Sleek and and Razzle discuss this at length, trying to decide what to do next, and they come up with a notion. They knew that there were humans amongst the dwarves who were acting as mercenaries, so they decided that they'd heard about the story of Cazador and the huge reward he was offering for the return of his family from Black Crag, where they were being held. Now, the prize was for a dwarf half of the entire wealth of his kingdom. For a human, if they did it, only a third. But Sleek Sharpwit and Razzle both knew that a third of the entire wealth of a kingdom would absolutely cripple Karakazul, and so if they could get the family back for a human, then they could talk into cooperating with them and making them wealthy beyond their wildest dreams, as humans are prone to greed, not quite as much as a Skaven, but nonetheless, they would be able to cripple weapon production in Karakazul. And thus they found an unwitting human to go along with their plan, at least at first, a Bretonian who joined the ranks of the mercenaries of Karakazul. They got this mercenary to go up to King Kazador, make the offer, and have him accept. So this human was going to go meet with the Skaven for the second time after he'd made the offer to King Kazador, but Handrick Hammerhand, who still felt great shame for leaving his position, allowing the Skaven to break through his lines, uh, saw what was going on, kind of got an instinct that this human wasn't acting quite right, that this offer was a little bit suspicious, and followed him down to the depths of Karakazul, where he saw him meeting with Sleek and Razzle. Now, the old rat told Razzle to go and fight this dwarven warrior away, and he would take the human with him. Razzle, being a backstabbing skaven that he is, says, how about you fight him, crippled old man, and teleported out of there with the human, leaving Sleek 
who at this point had to face down against to play the old man. He collapsed. Oh, please, please don't hurt me. Now, Sleek could speak perfect Kaladish, I think it is, the Dwarven language. Now, this is a rare trait in itself and threw the Dwarven warrior off his game, so much so that he was able to approach this rat. He so I kind of took mercy, sort of an old blind rat, but Sleek is no pathetic weakling and caused a grievous wound on Handrick Hammerhand, like breaking through the armor on his chest and I think it was with a warp stone dagger in fact stabbed him there causing it to almost be in constant pain but he was eventually found but Sleek managed to make his escape. Having survived this attack the old rat Sleek Sharpwit thought the plan could still work so he pitched it to Queek and he said Queek let's lose some of these uh, clan Eshin assassins they can go in get the family get them out quiet Sleek smooth operation will cripple Karakazul, they won't have the weapons, this plan will work. And Queek liked the idea of the plan, but he wanted to go into Black Crag himself and claim the head of the new boss there, who was Gorfang Rotgut, who was the orc in charge of the warband who'd kidnapped Kazador's family in the first place. Queek could almost sense another trophy on the horizon. And so Queek decided to go back to the City of Pillars, collect the majority of his own army, the large portion of which he'd left behind because he'd been given this expeditionary force. So he was going to go back, get that army, then go into the City of Pillars, and that's the way they were going to do it. Sleek, exasperated, but out of options in the open agreed, and they went and got Queek's army to march on Black Crag and the greenskins of Gorfang Rotgut. Queek gathers his army from the City of Pillars and starts to march towards Black Crag. Now, Queek doesn't exactly know the way, and he's taking his army over the surface, which makes all the Skaven in the group feel drastically uncomfortable. Queek himself has spent very little time out in the open air, and it does sort of vex him a little bit to be in this environment, although he doesn't fear it, he doesn't necessarily enjoy the experience at all. So the band are marching through the World's Edge Mountains, they are really just kind of accidentally finding their way towards Black Crag by hunting down Greenskin war parties, scouting parties, and following them back towards Black Crag, where they're obviously reporting in. Suffice it to say, Queek, his army, along with Scar, who has now recovered, back in full armor and by Queek's side, eventually make it to Black Crag, where they gather their army near the valley that is known as Death Pass. So Queek sets up headquarters near a tower that overlooks Death Pass, and he tells Sleek Sharpwit his plan. There's going to be a contingent of his army that does a frontal assault on the armies of Black Crag, who are marching out to meet them in the valley, and then there'll be another army that will come in from the flank and just take them from two sides. That's Queek's overall plan. Sleek Sharpwit recommends that Queek leads the frontal assault, but even Queek knows that the frontal assault is more of a distraction, a suicidal distraction at that. And so what he does is he decides to lead the army coming from the flank. And he tells Sleek Sharpwit to stay in the tower and command the forces from there, sending out messages where he can overlook the entirety of the battle. So Queek leaves the battle, leaves Sleek in the tower, goes down with his forces to lead the army from the flank. And he's joined by his buddy, Scar. So Queek, obviously at this point, throughout this entire time, has been whispering amongst his advisors, listening to their plans, listening to their advice, listening to the voices in his head telling him not to trust Sleek, not to trust Fizwick, the warlock, not to trust Razzle, the Gracier. Don't trust any of them and see them away. And indeed, Queek has been heeding this advice. And he tells Scar, Scar, I want you to go and deal with Razzle, who will be leading the forward assaulting army. And if you get a chance, if the battle doesn't kill him, towards the end, I want you to take his head. So he sends Scar off to join Razzle, the Gracier, for the frontal assault. 
Sleek is still up in the tower, and Queek has his own plans for him. As Scar kind of arrived for the whole conversation with Queek, he had handed Queek something in his hand, a bit of wiring, and Queek knew that the Warlock had been dealt with for better or worse. Now, the Warlock had been absent from our story for a little bit, but essentially what he'd done is he'd gone off, he'd stolen some weapons, and he'd built himself a Doom Wheel. So that's what the Warlock was doing. Battle kicks off, and it is an absolute sight to behold. It is just an enormous battle in its sheer scale. Razzle leads the frontal assault with Scar by his side. They go charging down the hill, and at first they're doing quite well. Queek comes in from the flank. They're absolutely tearing up the flank, but this is going to take hours and hours and hours. The sheer numbers involved in this battle, the sheer number of greenskins that Gorfang can call to his banner, is huge. This is going to be a war of attrition. So the battle rages on. However, in the front lines comes the first sign of disaster. We have Scar and the Gracia charging down, dealing with a number of uh, greenskins. However, a huge shadow suddenly looms over them, where a huge giant is involved, and he is just swinging his club, massacring Skaven as he goes, and it looks like Scar and Gracia are next in his line of attack. Now, from the left-hand side, are not Queek's flank, but from the other flank, uh, Warlock Fizzwick comes across with his Doom Wheel, and he's having a whale of a time, having smashed through the Greenskin's front line and just playing havoc behind them. Now, he's charging up the lightning cannon from the front of the Doom Wheel, and he's ready to fire it when he sees the perfect target, a giant off in the distance, and loving what his creation is about to unfold upon this ginormous monstrosity, he pulls the lever, and boom! The whole thing explodes. The explosion blasts back Greenskins and Skaven for hundreds of meters. In fact, Queek, who's over on the completely other flank of the battle, starts to see bits of the Doom Wheel rain down near his position. The explosion is just enormous, and Queek smiles to himself at happily made plans. Seeing where the Doom Wheel had exploded, he knew it was in the center. He was sure it had killed the Gracia, and unfortunately it probably killed Scar, but you know what, not all plans are perfect. Then he just grinned to himself at the fate that was going to befall the old Skaven up in the tower. Now Sleek up in the tower is observing the battle, seeing what's going on, when suddenly he hears somebody else approaching. He turns to see his buddy Fang Dao, the leader of the clan Eshin assassins, who he would kind of like grew friendly with over the course of their action behind the dwarven lines in the battle of Karakazul. But sensing deadly intent, Sleek suddenly gets put off. He realizes what has happened. Queek has paid the assassin to kill him. Now, Sleek, only weapons he has on him being the old Skaven he is are his crutches. And the assassin leaps upon him and is actually surprised by the skill with which Sleek actually manages to fend off his attacks. It appeared the old rat had been deceiving everybody with his level of frailty. And he watched the assassin blow for blow. The assassin managing to eventually get Sleek Sharpwit to lose his footing, tumbling him near the edge of the tower. And then out of sheer ferocity, the assassin leapt in the air, trying trying to finally deal the killing blow to this old Skaven. Using his one remaining crutch, the other having been knocked out of his hand, he fends off both of the assassin's blades, eventually managing to frustrate the assassin so much, he drops one of them to put all of his power, both arms, behind the single remaining blade to finally deal the deadly blow to this old Skaven. But Sleek is not only quicker than he would have appeared, but he is also stronger. He manages to push off the assassin who'd been stabbing wildly at the remaining crutch that Sleek had. Then through the crutch of solid wood, bits had started to chip off. The assassin started to sense metal underneath, and as he was thrown off by Sleek, Sleek starts to smack the crutch against the walls of the tower, revealing a glowing dwarven
sylvan magical blade and it instills such fear such confidence that sleek sharp wit has in fighting this assassin that fang dao eventually realizes he might not win this one and like all good skaven he cowers gives up and agrees to do whatever Sleek wants him to do. For he'd proven himself in combat, and this blade and the potential of its killing power just scared the bejesus out of Fang Dao. Sleek, knowing that this was an untrustworthy assassin, but it's the only thing he had on his side at the moment, orders Fang Dao to go down to the battle and find Razzle and bring him to a point where they can get in underneath Black Crag so they can finally get the Dwarven King's family out of there and ignore the rest of the battle going on. So, Fang Dao disappears off in his newly subservient role to Sleek Sharpwit, who was much stronger and quicker and retaining much more of his old skills than we had once been led to believe. For Sleek wasn't any ordinary advisor to Lord Nordwell. He was, in fact, the ex-leader of the City of Pillars. It was from him that Queek had taken over the leadership of the city. To rise to that position without having the leader of Clan Moors kind of looking over you and pushing you forward is something that can only be attained by surely the best of Skaven. And that's who Sleek Sharpwit was, and he didn't want anybody to forget it. So, now Sleek leaves the tower to go and meet up with his co-conspirators underneath Black Crag to attempt to rescue the Dwarven family. So Sleek gets to the point where they're on the ground underneath Black Crag to the rendezvous point he'd pointed out to Fang Dao, the assassin. And Fang Dao eventually joins him, he's brought Razzle, but along with them comes Scar. Now, Scar obviously had been told by Queek not to let Razzle out of his sight, so Scar's not sure, like, he just assumes this is all orders from Queek, so he's just going along, he assumes they're all on the same side. And Sleek gathers this and picks up on exactly why Scar's there in the first place, and so are they also joined by the albino guard of Razzle. And, you know, Sleek gets the idea of the situation very quickly. So what he does is he sort of gives a little speech to Razzle about his betrayal of him. He asks Razzle where the human is. Razzle, at some point from when he disappeared from Sleek in that teleportation and took the human with him, had lost track of the human. He didn't know where he was, and that's all that Sleek needed to know. And he turned to Scar after sort of convincing him they were all there under the yours of the Queek, and tells him, you know what Queek told me, Scar? He told me that you should do that thing you were ordered to do right now. Now, Razzle has his albino guard, and Scar is quick to engage them. And he grabs one and eventually ends up ramming his head into the ceiling, crushing the skull of the albino guard. But Scar then takes Razzle and kind of throttles him to near death. But Sleek stops him just at the very end and tells him to break his legs and leave him there. And so that's what they do with Scar, Sleek, Fang Dao go into the depths of Black Crag in order to find the dwarves family to carry out their plan and hopefully they'll find the human at some point later on. And so Sleek and his little party go into the Karak, they explore the tunnels, and they come across a bridge over a vast chasm. It's a hugely wide bridge, and they set about trying to cross it. Now, there are a number of greenskins and gobbos, and there are signs of a fight just going on, and there's a scent of human and dwarves in the air. So, Sleek kind of hides himself away, not wanting to reveal himself to the greenskins or to the humans around, and he sees the human that he'd actually been dealing with, with, rushing towards where they also suspect the family are being held. But the humans he had eventually gets completely surrounded by this rampaging horde of greenskins. Now, they think, oh god, we're going to lose this human, he's going to die, this is our hope, oh, this is going to go very badly. And he sends Fang Dao down to make sure, he charges him with making sure the human survives. Bring the human back to us, he's the key to our entire plan. Go get him. So Fang Dao goes, Sleek and Scar are still just watching from the top of the roofs, staying out of sight of the greenskins and the humans alike. And that is the point at which Queek arrives in the underground, leading a good number of storm vermin behind him, and they are charging through, slaughtering all of the greenskins having been left behind, and all of the greenskins in that sort of little 
converted greenskin settlement underneath Black Crag. He manages to capture the human and the dwarf uh, who were surrounded at that point by greenskins, and he's taking them back across the bridge he'd come from, having captured them. At this point, a contingent of dwarves come in, led by Haldrick Hammerhand, who we'd heard of earlier in the story. He had now taken the Slayer Oath, his chest wound there for all to see that Sleek had imparted upon him, and he was leading a contingent of dwarves, having overheard the story of what was going on, but not wanting to uh, involve the whole of Karakazul and just leading a party to beat the Skaven plan here and to save the, the king's family himself so that he wouldn't be indebted to this human and his Skaven co-conspirators. But he's, t he's a slayer now, having taken the Slayer Oath for his shame in both the battle and in being wounded by Sleek. Uh, so they charge forward and they meet on this bridge and the two sides engage in combat, fighting fiercely amongst each other. It just rampages on. Eventually, Hammerhand finds Queek and they start to battle it out. Queek's speed and dexterity take Hammerhand by surprise. Queek's spinning and dexterity surprised Hendrick. He compared it even to elvish dancers he'd once seen. And every time he rubbed up against Queek's armor, his skin burnt through the warp shard armor that Queek was wearing. Queek spun around, tried to backhand smash in Hendrick's face with Dwarf Grouger, but he hit nothing but air. Hendrick had rolled forward, not before Queek's second blade had nearly grazed his chin, loosening some orange hairs from his beard. And there, the two faced off against each other. Queek thinks this is a good one. He might keep it up, Queek said. Hendrick replied, Hendrick thinks you're a bloody loon, head taker. Queek spat back. Everyone, they concerned for Queek's sanity. Perhaps you worry less what is in Queek's head and more on keeping what is in yours. Hendrick shrugged. I can do two things at once. Queek lunged forward for him, screaming, Die, die, dwarf thing. Hendrick stumbled away from Queek's sword and raised his axe to block the incoming, furiously quick blow from Dwarf Gouger, and his ancient axe shattered, sending Hendrick to the ground. Queek stood over him, ready to deliver the killing blow. When suddenly Scar, in all of his armor, came falling out of the sky from the direction of behind the dwarves. Scar was about to join in the fray with the Skaven, sneaking up behind the dwarven position, but something had struck him with such ferocity that it sent him flying across, landing almost at the feet of Queek. Queek, eager to see what had caused his champion Scar to go flying that far, started rushing in that direction, but he heard it before he saw it, with the simple cry of WAH GORFANG! Now Gorfang was a huge orc, absolutely staggering in size, and as his weapon he seemed to carry around a dwarven statue leg as a simple club that he would use to devastating effect. And as he saw Queek, he blurted out, this is my place ratty, as though like some bizarre scene out of Wind in the Willows. So what you reckon? Think you's hard enough for some of this? Queek replied, big meat you came. Gorfang, I've heard you were cracked ratty. I like that. As the enormous club came swinging down towards Queek, Queek leapt backwards. The huge vibrations that this club had caused stung his feet. But he darted forward, seeing that Gorfang had in fact stuck his club into the dwarven carved floor and was having difficulty getting it back out. Queek darted straight at Gorfang, round the club, past his arms, between his legs, an uppercutted dwarf gouger straight into Gorfang's groin. Thinking he dealt a near deadly blow, at least one to cripple Gorfang, but all he heard was laughter. I got the thickest armor around, Ratty. Queek, not put off, retrieved Dwarf Gouger from its place lodged in the metallic groin of Gorfang and began to strike wildly around. But Dwarf Gouger could not split the thickness of the armor. It was not that he couldn't split it, as it, it couldn't penetrate deep enough to actually hit Gorfang. He was wearing such thick armor. And so he continued to strike blow for blow, but he just couldn't do any lasting damage to Gorfang. At some point, 
Gorfang just managed to catch Queek with a backhand so ferocious it sent Queek hurtling like a cannonball back into the ranks of his own Skaven. Indeed, Queek smashed into other Storm Vermin, but he just took them along with such was the force of the hit. Queek managed to land, get himself off the storm vermin he'd landed on, who he'd struck with such force that he'd shattered that storm vermin's back. Queek got up, exasperated, ready to charge back into combat when he suddenly felt a hand on his shoulder. Just completely confused by what was going on and slightly, uh, you know, set ajar by the strike he'd just taken. Queek hesitated, not knowing what it was or who it was who had grabbed him, but he could smell a dwarf. And indeed, a hood went back on a cloaked dwarf, and it was revealed that there was some kind of shaven, scarred dwarf who then threw Queek aside, smashing him into the side wall of the bridge they'd been fighting on, and charged that Gorfang, leaping all about him. Queek would later learn evidently that this must have been the prince, the son of Kazador, who Gorfang had left behind, and the two of them were engaged in a fearsome duel. Sleek had used the opportunity of this battle to get his way, to free the prisoners, to free the human and the dwarf with them, and so he went down and couldn't pick up the human by himself, he needed help, so he got Fang Dao to come down and help him, but that still wasn't enough, and so they had to go and pick up Scar from the floor where he'd been knocked by Gorfang. Scar was beginning to come to his senses and indeed they carried up the prisoners and took them out of the battle, out of Black Crag, uh, back up to the surface. So we have Queek, Fang Dao and Scar all going back up to the surface trying to flee. On the surface, Sleek encouraged them all to move rapidly. He told them to do this for a reason he couldn't divulge publicly, and that was he was scared that Queek was going to be following them. Sleek, obviously, was still lying to Scar, who thought he was still serving in Queek's interests, and they also had Fang Dao carrying the two prisoners. The human had been injured uh, in his encounter with the Greenskins, and they were trying to make good time. As they were leaving Black Crag, they could see dwarven gyrocopters flying overhead, and a whole dwarven army at the gates of Black Crag itself charging in. These were the armies of Karakazul, who had come down to face off against the orcs of Black Crag, following obviously their contingent, including the prince who had gone there in search of the king's family. And so it seemed that Black Crag and Karakazul had launched into a fresh war, a fresh conflict. Fung Dao, though, at some point suddenly pulled a dagger, and Sleek thought, ah, here it comes, the expected betrayal. Not to worry, I can probably deal with Fang Dao. Suddenly, though, as though shocked, Stunned, Fang Dao freezes in place and peers down where there is a sword protruding from the middle of his chest. Then he falls into the mist of the barren moors which they were running across when behind him appears Queek. Queek waits for this old thing. Queek burns for this as Queek licked the blood from his blade left there by the assassin he'd just killed. Traitor meat has the sweetest of tastes. And so Scar, realizing kind of that he'd been used, just falls on the feet of Queek and says, Boss, boss, I'm sorry. I didn't, I wasn't betraying you. I didn't, I thought I was doing what you wanted to do. And for better or worse, after some back and forth, Queek is like, all right, Scar, calm down. Just go sit over there, you whimpering bastard. And he sends him off to the side. And then Queek is faced with Sleek Sharpwit, his predecessor of sorts, and the old man with the magical dwarven blade. Now, Sleek is no fool, but at this point he just loses his temper and all pretense falls away. And he just says, you are a mad thing, fool, fool. You are incompetent and I betrayed you for the glory of Skavendom. Now, Sleek is kind of out of options here. There's no way around it. It's going to be him versus Queek. Now, Sleek is old. He's not as old as he pretends to be, but he is. He's not the warrior he once was. And he know Queek is a warrior of the highest caliber. He has one last option, a kind of insurance plan that Sleek had always has. And that's that one of his back teeth had been replaced with a piece of warp stone, a warp toe if you will. And when Skaven chew down and eat these little bits of warp stone, they're just infused with a new energy, but it can have horrific side effects as well. So it's a risk, 
but Sleek has no options but to use this and his blade to face down Queek Head Taker. And so he bites down and swallows his inbuilt warpstone tooth. Queek opened the confrontation by darting forward with Dwarf Gouger. There wasn't much strength in the blow, and Sleek managed to bar it aside while planting an elbow straight into Queek's snout. This was a lazy attempt, Sleek could see. The Warlord was in no rush. He intended to enjoy this. When they clashed again, the effects of the warpstone on Sleek's muscles had begun to take effect. His eyes cleared up. He was stronger than he'd perhaps ever been, and he met Queek's second blow head on, and the two locked blades pairing off their strength against each other, and Sleek almost enjoyed the look of shock that crept over Queek's face. The two clashed blades over and over. Sleek could scarcely believe the speed at with which Queek moved, but he was managing to match him blow for blow. And there, to his surprise, he could just hear Queek sniggering. And he thought, oh my god, Queek is actually enjoying this confrontation. What a lunatic. He shouts out some insult, saying that he was twice the warlord Queek ever was, and Queek just says he doesn't care. That Sleek was stupid. He's not that smart. He was was stupid enough to go against Queek, and they continue their confrontation. Even with the Warpstone, Sleek knew the effects would wear off, and then Queek would have the advantage, and so then he promised to himself that it didn't matter whether he lived as long as he took this mad thing down with him, and he launched a flurry of attacks, charging at Queek. Queek had managed to kind of strike most of his bows away, but he got through Queek's defenses, slamming him down to the ground, but not before Queek had managed to take a massive slice out of Sleek's bicep with Dwarf Gouger. The two fell upon each other, with Sleek continuing to try and stab Queek in the back, but his blade only coming up against the warp shard armor of Queek over and over and over again. Queek eventually manages to wrestle Sleek off of him as he gets back up, and he feels behind his back at all the deep gouges that Sleek's blade had left in his back, burning his fingertips as he pulled them away. Then Queek went in for another bow. Sleek tried to counter, but in his attack against Queek, all the warp dust that had fallen off the armor had melted the palm of Sleek's hand to his own blade, so Sleek couldn't move his blade quickly enough, and Queek got in, slicing off Sleek's hand, and as the blood started to drain out of Sleek, he suddenly felt empty. His legs went to sleep, and he slipped in a puddle of his own blood. You're not nearly so good as you think you are, Mad Thing. Does the dead thing talk, replied Queek. The hands on Queek's trophy rack seem to be applauding Sleek goodbye. And it's at this point that Sleek has some kind of mental conundrum, his biggest fears coming to life. For Sleek's biggest fear was being forgotten. He was already some kind of living ghost, having lived to the merry old age of 12 years old. And he says, we steal so much from the dwarf things, why don't we steal their love and remembrance? And effectively it boils down to Sleek saying all he ever wanted was to be remembered. At which point Queek leans in and says, Queek will always remember you. And in the rain, as lightning streaked across the sky, greeted by a huge clap of thunder, Queek dealt the killing blow. He then proceeded to rip Sharpwit's head from his body and place it on his trophy rack, filling the gap that Blacktooth had left. And thus ended Sleek. And at this point, Queek picks up Sleek's dwarven weapon to add instead of his old sword, and turns around to deal with the human and the dwarf, only to discover their abandoned bindings and the fact that they had managed to escape and sneak into the night. Now, looking out before him in the night sky, he could see the gyrocopters attacking Black Crag, the dwarven armies at the gate, and he had seen that he had succeeded in his mission to a certain extent, in that Karak Azul was now locked into combat with Black Crag, and most likely unable to produce any excess weapons. They'll be too preoccupied with fighting this war that Queek had in some way aided to bring upon them. At least that's the logic of the story. Not my own, I have to stress. Queek, from this point on, retreated back to the City of Pillars where he continues his fight with Skarsnik and Belagar to this day. 
Overall, Queek is quite insane. There are moments of lucidity where he uses tactical acumen to win a number of different victories, but even his master, Lord Nordwell, knows he is not a subtle tool. He, in fact, compares Queek to hunting with dynamite. You'll get the job done, but it won't be subtle and it won't be pretty. But he does get it done. That's why Lord Nordwell continues to support him and still considers him Clan Moors' top general. He just gets the job done, although not a surgeon's knife, but more akin to a sledgehammer. In terms of some of Queek's rules on the tabletop, on the tabletop, Queek has a hatred for greenskins and dwarves, reflecting uh, his attitudes towards Skarsnik and Belagar, of course. Um, he has his uh, trophy heads, which grant him a bonus to hit and wound in a challenge. The idea that he likes challenging, likes collecting heads for his trophy rack, he's good at challenges. So if you were to challenge someone in the tabletop, he'd be better at fighting in a challenge. He also has an extreme distrust of Graciers, which we've kind of covered in our story of Queek so far, but effectively how this translates as a rule on the tabletop is that he can't be placed in a unit with Graciers. We've already seen how this is translated in Total War Warhammer 2 in that he has certain abilities that grants him disloyalty towards Graciers, so Graciers and his armies are more likely to rebel. That's the kind of idea with Queek. He also has Dwarf Gouger, which is a w weapon that grants no armor saves against it on the tabletop, and he has his Warp Shard armor, which would do damage to you if you attacked Queek. That's the idea of the Warp Shard armor. It would burn you with its warp dust as every time you hit it. And that about sums it up for Queek on the tabletop. We've seen a bit of him in action on our campaign stuff, guys. Do check out my Skaven War video, my Skaven Battle video popping up in the top right, or even the Scam Skaven Campaign video, again, in the top right or down in the description below to see the Skaven in action. Can't wait to get my hands on him in just a few days from now, guys. Hope you enjoyed this story. As always, a huge thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons, Huli, Reese, Colin, Matthias, Samuel, Mathies, David, Peter, Sign of the Emperor, Niblitz, Calef, Nigel, Hankster, Zelhurt, and James. Thank you guys again, and I hope to catch you all on the next one.